Take your Bible, if you would, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I have it up on the screen, but I really, really would like for you to uh, open your Bibles up on this. Now, this is going to sound a little familiar uh, to those uh, who were, I think, I think it was last Sunday night, maybe. But this has been on my heart all week. And it has everything to do with being tried, being tested, bad things that happen to you when you know that you've been trying to live for the Lord, trying to do right, trying to serve Him, trying to please Him. Understand that no amount of your works, your good deeds, anything like that, count as anything with God. Do you understand that? You understand that just because you went all day without thinking a curse word, that God then is going to reward you with some great reward. Now, if you went through the day and a curse word came to your mind, you might not have the best of times afterward. But understand that every good thing, every good gift that comes from above to you is coming to you by grace alone. And did you know that your next door neighbor or these people over here across the street or these people up here at the VH, uh, VH almost said VHF hall. My goodness, we ain't had VHF TV in what, 20, 30 years? Up here at the VFW hall, did you know that they still live, they live under the same grace that you do? Did you know they're breathing the same air you're breathing? They're spending the same money that you're spending. They have clothes on their back. They have a house over their head. They have air conditioning in a hundred degree heat. They have, they have things. They have a car. They have uh, power tools. They have a nice vacuum cleaner. Those people, lost people in this world, have blessings that you have. So it's not by who lives the best determines who gets the best. It's all given by grace. But there's one thing that those people, outside of them coming to the Lord, there's one thing that they will never, ever get. And that is a home in eternity with Jesus Christ forever. Somebody say amen. So we have that assured to us in the Bible. However, as I've said this before many times, I grew up here in this church, and I sort of grew up with rose-colored glasses in a fantasy land that believed that every adult in this church was a god fearing, Bible-loving saint of the living God, and they did no wrong, thought no wrong, said no wrong. And then, as time went on, I began to see some of them fall away. And that troubled me, because in some cases, some of these people used to be my Sunday school teacher. Or they would go on church outings with us kids and I just thought the world of them. And then I found out that some of them were drunkards. Found out some of them were adulterers. And who knows, maybe even worse. So this morning, I, I guess I'm just doing more teaching than anything else. 
And I want to teach you something that uh, last week while we was on vacation, I had some nights that I didn't sleep very well. I'd wake up and I'd grab my tablet so I could read my Bible on there. And I was reading this and it just really jumped out at me. It jumped out and hit me. It's about a certain number and I made notes on it and everything like that. It's probably 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And um, while I'm on vac I told Lisa, while I'm on vacation, here I'm writing sermons. But that's okay. When they come, I've learned I better write them, better put them down, or I'll forget them. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. I want you to have your Bible open there. And I want you to read it out of your Bible and, and mark some things, all right? God's, and this is the last instructions that God through Moses is given to the Israelites. Moses at the end of Deuteronomy is going to die. And it's, then it's going to be Joshua who leads them into the promised land. Of course, Moses cannot go because he disobeyed God in striking the rock when he should have spoken to the rock. And that's a different sermon. But anyway, let's read it. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do. How many commandments? All of them. That you may live. That was, the, that was the Old Testament covenant. The Old Testament covenant was do and live. Do and live. But if you don't do all that I've commanded you, the first commandment, the second commandment, the third, the fourth, the fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, if you don't do all of those commandments, you're going to die. That's what he's saying. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Now we know that land is heaven for us. Say amen. Who wants to go to heaven? Say amen. Amen. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these how many years? 40 years and that number just stood out at me uh, that early in the morning it just jumped out now I study numbers and they've just been an interest to me but I can see clearly that God lays things out in patterns he does things in order and the number 40 is defined in this verse 40 years in the wilderness what was the purpose of the 40 years. Number one, to humble thee. Because God resists the proud, doesn't he? But he gives grace to the humble. So the 40 has to do with God humbling you. Number two, and to prove thee. It has to do with proving. It's like a, it's a probation number. And I'll explain that in a minute after we pray. Um, to prove thee. To know what was in thine heart. Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And it's just that simple. Let's pray. Father, I ask your blessings now upon this. Lord, you can teach it a whole lot better than I can. And I'm thankful, Lord, for what you've taught me out of this. There's probably more things that I should learn, need to learn. Lord, I never want to be done learning. So, Father... Keep teaching me like you did with this. Lord, I wasn't sure about some had said this number was a number of probation. I wasn't sure, but now I am. 56 years old and you started teaching me numbers when I was about 32. And Lord, you're still doing it. Thank you, God, for doing that for me. I never want to stop learning. I never want to stop giving what I've learned. Lord, bless your word this morning. And, and Lord, teach us some things that we need to know. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, have you ever met people that said they were Christians, went to church, did all the things that church people do, later on, you found out that they were not who they pretended to be. You ever met anybody like that? Do you know somebody like that? Fake, the Bible calls them false brethren. There are false Christs. There are false doctrines. There are false apostles. There are false, did I say Bibles? There are false Bibles. And there are false brethren. And all of those have the intention, the devil uses them to misguide, mislead people into error. Somebody, I guarantee you, you know somebody who maybe their dad or their mom or their grandma drugged them to church when they was a kid every Sunday. And, oh, I was at church every Sunday. My grandma took me and it was a Pentecostal church. I mean, they were, they were the hardcore ones. But I, as I grew up, became an adult, I knew some of those people I'd see them down at the bar that I used to hang out in. See, some of them with women that they, I knew that wasn't their wives. And, and they used that then as an excuse to say, you ain't getting me in no church. You're full of hypocrites. Well, in some cases, that's probably true. And I can tell you, I've, since being here, all these years, not just the time as pastor, but all these years I've been here, I can tell you that false brethren have, have been in out of these doors. And God always has a way of proving who is and who isn't. And this message is designed toward the two people. First, if you really are born again, saved, love the Lord, serving God, you have your name written in the book of life, there will be tests that you will go through in life and God will prove you through those tests. So that it is known that you really are who you say you are. Amen? But in those same tests, you could be sitting in this room right now. Claiming to be born again, saved, child of the living God. Ready for Jesus when he returns. Going to go to heaven when you die. You will go through the same test. God won't make it any harder on you than he will anybody else. And you'll fail. And it will be known that you're not who you pretended to be all these years. Um, turn to, um, let's see if I have this in my notes here before I... Oh, no, I don't. Turn to um, turn to First Peter. First Peter is one of my favorite books in the Bible. If you wanted to, if 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 something happened, I happened to die. I want the entire book of First Peter printed on my headstone. All five chapters. Start at the front and make it go all the way around to the back if you have to because it first Peter is that book that when you read it you'll understand how God takes you through things in life 
to prove whether or not you are who you say you are. He'll, now, let me, let me ask you this question. Does God already know? He already knows, doesn't he? So he didn't have to prove it to him. He already knows that you're not. Here's who he's proving it to. Number one, he's proving it to you. Because if you have ever doubted if you were saved or not. I remember being on the phone with a pastor friend of mine and I was bawling my eyes out over a situation. And I mean, it was bad. And this pastor was telling me about how he knew other pastors that were falling away and how they weren't even, weren't even saved. And I asked him, I said, am I? Am I saved? He said, Mike, I believe you are. I needed to hear that because not too long after that, what it was, it was one of those days, I mean, devils were just chewing me up. And I reached out to someone that I trusted and I called him and we talked. And just not too long after I got off the phone with him, I prayed and all of a sudden, I mean, boom, every devil was gone. And I said, thank you, God, I needed that. I needed that. So first, chapter 1, he says um, in verse 5, he says, who are kept, but the word before that is you. So you... Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So, who keeps you? God does. Is any of us strong enough to keep ourselves? No. If it wasn't for God... If it wasn't for God, I'd have probably walked out of this church almost as soon as I walked in the pastor's office. If it wasn't for God. And then over the years, good things happen, bad things happen. And if it wasn't for God, I'd have walked out. Even, even sometimes with life itself, sometimes you feel like walking out. You know what I'm saying? And if it hadn't been for God, I wouldn't be here today. It is not by my power, neither is it by yours. So that in itself is the humbling part that God promised, to humble you. So that you realize it wasn't you. When Gideon had his army slashed down to 300 men and all he gave them was a lantern and a sword, and said, stand on these mountains. When you see me do it, you do it. And that's how we're going to win. That was a way, that was God's way of proving to Israel it never was their power. It was God's. Why did God not want David to number his armies? Same reason. David, if you number your armies and then you go out and fight a battle... You're going to think 
that it's because you had so many in your military that that's what won you the battle. But David, you fought enough battles before, you ought to know it's not how many you got in the battle. It's who you got with you in the battle. So he says, uh, we're kept by the power of God. Verse 6, wherein great ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to insist that you do this. Understand. Everybody listen to me for a second. Everybody look up here. If you want to, if you want to, and you're at a time in life where you feel like you are going through a lot of temptations and trials and you would just like to raise your hand to have God's people pray for you. You can do you don't have to, but you can now if you want to. Amen. Amen. So wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse seven then, this is for you. That the trial of your what? It's never your works. Never. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God didn't say to you, now if you go for a whole day without thinking of a curse word against your husband, you'll be blessed today or your wife or your neighbor aren't you glad that God did not lay that as your test he made a very simple test and he said do you trust me That story, I'm going to tell you now because he's not here and he's not listening. While we were in the process of trying to adopt Caleb, I went through a very testing time. God taught me a lot of this. And... It looked like for a while it was going to be a slam dunk. It was going to be the easiest thing in the world. But then some things changed. And I won't tell you what all it was, but we were afraid that we weren't going to get him. And one morning I woke up and the Holy Ghost is sitting right there on my bed waiting for me to wake up. And as soon as I woke up, the Holy Ghost said, Mike, do you trust me? And before I could lie, he said, you don't. Now I'm going to tell you what he meant by that. I've never told this before. I'm going to tell you what he meant by that. And why I still believe what I believe. The Holy Ghost said, Mike, you believe that the only way that Caleb could ever go to heaven is that if you raise him in a good Christian home, teach him the Bible, teach him everything that you know, and that's how he'll go to heaven. And God said, Mike, I can save anybody I want to from any situation that there is, and it'll have nothing to do with you. And I said, God, you're right. I don't trust you, I trust myself. 
worst thing in the world people to do is trust yourself. You'll me you will mess that up every single time. In fact, See all these notes here I got? Y'all don't think I'm going to make that today, do you? I'm going to tell you the story of what happened. We, um, it came down to they were going to have a trial to see whether or not they should terminate parental rights on him from his parents. His birth father never wanted anything to do with him. Never. He never showed up for any visit. Maybe Was it one? Maybe he did. But for the trial, he didn't even show up for the trial. Even though he was summoned, he never showed up. So that was, that was the easy part. The, the part we were worried about was that his birth mom, and I won't get into all that she did, but she did some of the things that the court required of her to do. And we were in the courtroom when the judge, they had a whole, they had, a, they had planned the trial for one day, one whole day on a Thursday and then half a day on a Friday. When they got done with the whole day Thursday, both sides said, we have an, another entire day of testimony that we know we can't fit into tomorrow. So both sides agreed, let's extend this to next Thursday. Now I'm kicking stuff and I'm, you know, I want this over with. And here I am, you know, not trusting God. Well, one of the conditions that birth mom had to be under in order to get him back was she was to not have a continuing relationship with birth dad because birth dad didn't want him and was going to continue in the life that he was living and that was one of the conditions. So they agreed to extend their trial to the next week. So the next Thursday, Lisa and I, we go into the prosecutor's office. And the prosecutor comes in in a huff. She's sweating, breathing heavily. And she said, we've just had something major happen in this case. Now I'm going, is that major good or major bad? And she said, we'll, we'll let you know here in a little bit. That there's a bailiff here at the courthouse that had a run-in over the weekend. And what had happened was the birth mom, after that first day of trial, on the weekend, called birth dad and said, come down and pick me up and I'll party with you. Now, she's not supposed to have anything to do with him. Apparently, and she lives with her mom. Now, apparently her mom found out and said, I'm making this part up, but I'm going like, she must have said, you idiot. You're trying to get your kid back and you're inviting the dad down. He's not supposed to be around or have any part of this. So birth dad drives down from St. Louis, goes to the door of their house, knocks on the door, 
It's 11.30 at night. Nobody's answering. So he's beating on the door. Nobody's answering. He goes out and he's honking the horn. Nobody's coming to the door. Somebody called the police. The Jefferson County deputy who responded to that call was a bailiff at the courthouse who knew that this case was going on. She gets to the house. Birth mom says, I don't know what he's doing here. He's not supposed to be here. I'm trying to get my kid back, blah, blah, blah. They find out birth dad's got a warrant for his arrest, so she arrests him, puts him in the back of the car, empties out his pockets, his cell phone's there and everything like that. She's in the car filling out the, the re arrest report, and all of a sudden, his phone lights up, and it's a text message from birth mom saying, I'm sorry, and all that stuff. You know, I, I, I'm sorry I got you arrested. You know, I never should have called you. In other words, she admitted all of this. And the officer looks up and reads that, puts that down in her notes. Now, the reason why I know that story so well is that out of like a seven or eight page judgment that the judge made to terminate parental rights, part of it was, number one, he told birth mom, I didn't ask you, I didn't suggest to you, he said, I ordered you to do these eight things. You did three of them and thought that was enough. And he said, legally, I can't give you parental rights. But then the judge spent three pages writing that story as part of his judgment with the conclusion that I am convinced that birth mom will have a continuing relationship with birth dad, therefore I'm terminating parental rights. Now, had that court gone the way it was supposed to, Thursday and then the next day, that event would have never happened. It happened the Sunday between those two days, exactly the way God planned it. I've never told that story in my life to anybody except very close people. And I'm telling you, I had my faith. That was, that was the time when I picked up the Bible, bawling, and I said, Lisa, you better tell me whether this book is right. And she said, you know it is. I believe that my son will be in heaven one of these days. In spite of the life that he's living now, God has already told me years ago, Mike, it wouldn't have mattered if you raised him or not. If I want him to be in heaven, he will be in heaven. God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will pardon whom I will pardon. Can I hear you say amen? I'm telling you, I've been through the fire. That's just one story. I had no idea I was going to share that story. I probably shouldn't have. But I'm telling you, you're going to go through a trial. And it's going to look like it's the end of the world. And yet God specializes in the end of the world. Does he not? What happens when God ends the world? He's going to give a brand new one after that. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Now, let's bow our heads.